Hello, good uh, afternoon, I think. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, it's exciting for me as I've never been to PositConf before, so it's a really new experience for me. Um, my name is uh, indeed Hannes Mühleisen. Um, once my clicker works, then I will be happier. There we go. Um, and I'm here to talk about uh, in-process analytical uh, data management with DuckDB. Um, just a quick poll, who here has heard of DuckDB? Oh wow, and who has not heard of DuckDB? Okay, so um, that's, I, that's, I'm, really, I'm really happy about that because you know, okay, uh, it's, um, it's good, to, good to see that people have heard of us. Um, I wanna start a bit with like a bit of a motivation why DuckDB exists, um, and it actually is interesting how that is very deeply connected to the R community. So in the tradition of putting Hadley on a slide, um, I was working in a database architectures research group back in Amsterdam a couple of years ago, and then we realized that data scientists, and specifically R users, um, really hated data management systems. And it hurt our feelings a little bit. So here's a quote from Hadley. Um, if your data fits in memory, there is no advantage of putting it into a database. It will only be slower and more frustrating. Okay, and we have we thought very much about that, and we have we, then we realized that he was right. Um, databases can be very frustrating. So here we have uh, sort of the you know the good and the bad uh, bandits here, and they can be very bad. Uh, setting up databases is, is very difficult. Um, even for somebody who has a, a PhD in data management systems, setting up Postgres is a daunting task sometimes. Um, it, it, this is, uh, seriously. And I have, I have seriously, I've, tr I've set up so many systems over the years because you, know, you need to run experiments and so on and so forth. And my favorite one, I think, like a little anecdote, you cannot literally install IBM DB2 and Oracle on the same machine. It's just not possible. But of course, you know, it took me a week to realize this. Anyways, installation. Um, maintenance. Uh, yeah, so then once you have installed this thing, uh, you need to somehow make sure it runs. You know, we have to deal with user accounts, all that stuff. You have to update. All not very pretty. And something that really came out when we worked with data people is the data transfer. In fact, we wrote a, a paper about how slow transfer back and forth from databases. You would actually not believe that. If, if you not start to run experiments in it, even for something like Spark, you know, that uses just ancient protocols, it's not a great, great user experience. So that's bad. There is also good things in databases. For example, you know, the, the I don't know, 40 or so years, no, actually at this point it's 50 years since relational databases have existed. Um, we have spent a lot of time on optimizing queries so that the user doesn't have to actually become a database engine in their head and start you know, reshuffling things in order to make them faster. This should be automatic. Persistence, right? The original motivation of making data management systems was to get rid of these file zoos that people write like you know, custom programs to operate on to make sort of changes to set files and instead have sort of a defined transactional persistence model with updates and consistency. That's quite useful. Um, and of course, most notably, especially in my community of analytical data management systems, uh, we have spent a lot of time working on efficiency and parallelism. But the problem was that the frustrating bits were kind of hiding the good stuff. And the good way of looking at this was that people have been sort of ignoring the sandwich principle, as I like to call it. People have spent a lot of time optimizing like the patty, whether it's vegetarian or not, is up to you. Um, optimizing that till the end of the world. Like there is hundreds of papers on how to optimize a join, but we've literally wrote the first paper on optimizing client protocols, right? Um, nobody has ever really looked at the user end-to-end -end user experience. And I think that's why people perceive these things as to be frustrating and would actually rather invent their own than to touch that stuff. So in comes DuckTV. So we wrote a new data management system from scratch um, together with um, my former PhD student, Mark Rasfeld, um, that is basically tried to fix this end-to-end -end user experience. So it's, um, it's in process. I will explain to you in a bit what that means, just so that you can have a better user experience. Um, it is still, despite focusing on the end-to-end, -end, a state-of-the-art uh, data execution engine that can you know, really um, go through data in a very, very quick way. Um, and the best part, it's free and open source. So you can just use it. It's MIT licensed. I always say, you know, you know go build a company on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be happy about it. First question, why is it called DuckDB? It's 
because I used to have a duck. OK. <laughs> it's true, what can I say? Um, <laughs> OK, so let me go a bit about the, sort of the design philosophy of DuckDB. The first is it should be simple, right? Like, we shouldn't have to have a PhD in databases in order to set this thing up. And we also, it also shouldn't be you know, like hard to use. So one thing we noticed is that a database that a lot of people are quite, get quite comfortable with is SQLite. And why is SQLite so easy to use? Well, because it's in process, which means that the, data, the database system actually runs directly to whichever process you link to. So in R, you have uh, Kirill's R SQLite package that you can just like load, and then you can just run SQLite without any external setup. Isn't that great? So we copied that idea for DuckDB. DuckDB runs fully in process, uh, which also has some really great benefits for data transfer, um, one of the other frustrations that I will talk to you uh, in a bit about. DuckDB doesn't have dependencies. Um, so we just have a giant blob of C++ code that, uh, well, yeah, that uh, you can just install with install.packages, right? It's, it doesn't have external dependencies besides DBI and R. Um, in, in, in Python, it works, uh, I said the P word, it works the same way. You can just, you can just install uh, DuckDB as a package and it, will just, and, and it will just run. But again, you, don't, you shouldn't be fooled by it being simple. Uh, by taking it as simplistic or sort of, you know, limited in terms of what the engine can do. So as I mentioned, we have transactions, we have persistence, we have extensive relational features like, you know, complex joins, aggregates, window functions. DuckDB can read and write Parquet files out of the box, CSV files, JSON file, all in parallel. It's really quite fully featured. Um, DuckDB is very fast too. And, you know, I know everybody says this, but this is not just like, oh, we run a benchmark and it was fast. But the people always ask me, why is it fast? How, what do you do? And then it's sometimes very difficult to explain. So I asked um, the team what I should say, and I said, just say it's magic. <laughs> of course, any sufficiently advanced uh, technology is indistinguishable from magic, as you know. So what is the magic here? The magic is that it's the culmination of decades of research in analytical data management systems, literally. Tens of PhDs went into the basic concepts that we, that we basically implemented at DuckDB. Some of in our own group in the database research group in Amsterdam, some from other groups. But it really is this culmination. How does this sort of show itself? Well, um, one of the advantages of DuckDB and, 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 and that makes it really fast is that it can automatically parallelize very complex SQL queries over all the available SQL, uh, uh, CPU cores. But the, the problem is that this also, Spark can also do this. But the problem is, in order to get good utilization, it's not enough to just blindly parallelize. You also have to get a good efficiency on a per core level. And DuckDB is also really good at that um, with tight, highly efficient C++ code. Um, it, for example, can also use the disk if there's not enough RAM available to complete a query. So we can go out of core on all the operators. And this all happens completely um, Sort of automatically, transparently to the user. So you just type your query and go off. One thing that you can sort of notice when you're on DuckDB that your laptop might get a bit warm, right? That's just, it's a bit of a downside sometimes if it's hot outside, I don't know. Um, yeah, and I mentioned DuckDB is free. So it's just, you know, no, no, choose all four. Um, a bit about R, uh, since everybody here loves R, DuckDB loves R as well. In fact, the whole idea of creating a new database management system came out of the interactions with the R community. And I want to mention uh, Thomas Lumley and uh, Anthony D'Amico, maybe some of you know them, um, who really pushed us because we were working with them as a sort of, why do you hate us so much? And then you know, we, we came up with solutions. And they said, yeah, this is better, but still not good enough. And we, you know, we went back to our little uh, you know, lab and continued and continued. Um, and this was really productive. It went on for many years. And in the end, it was really clear what needed to happen. And also how to deeply integrate that into R. We also worked a lot with, with R core on, for example, the entire Altrep framework. So we could do more clever things with, with DuckDB in connections with R. So one thing that's really clever uh, that came out of this is that DuckDB runs in process. In R, it runs in the same process uh, as like, the R interpreter itself, OK? That, that sounds a bit technical. I realize that. But one big advantage of that is that if because we run in the same process, we can actually look 
at the data frames that exist in the R process itself. So if you want to just run a query on a data frame, we don't have to sort of go through like some serialization, write it to Parquet file, read it again, I don't know. Uh, we can just look directly at the memory um, and say, hey, this looks like some bits from a data frame. Maybe you can just make that look like a table and then you can run queries on it. And similarly, the query results in DuckDB can directly become our data frames in the same process without having to go through IPC or anything like that, right? So we can basically say, you run a query, it has a, it has a million rows of result sets, which normally would be the end of the world in a sort of traditional setup with client server. Um, but with DuckDB, that's just like, whoop, okay, there you go. Um, we even have some sort of tricks where we sometimes we don't even have to uh, transform the data, we can directly use the R structures. Again, saying the P word, of course, the same trick also works in Pandas. So if you have a Pandas data frame sitting there, uh, that works as well. Um, but now I'm gonna sort of do the uh, unimaginable and try a live demo. Um, wish me luck. What, how am I on time? Eight minutes, that's perfect. Um, so, so for our people in the back, I'm gonna switch to, to, to mirroring here because otherwise I cannot see what on earth is going on. Okay, oops, can you read this in the back? Uh, can you read this in the back? Okay, so, R. <laughs> so I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna copy paste some code because nobody wants to see me typing while I'm a bit nervous. Um, what, no, not install packages. See, I already made a mistake. I don't want to install packages because the Wi-Fi is wonky. So in order to start up DuckDB, um, you just basically, you load up DBI, okay? And then you can do a DB connect like the really traditional DBI thing that's, um, thing. and for this demo, I have two connections. I have a con underscore PG and have a con underscore DD. The PG one obviously talks to a, a Postgres server that I have just here running locally on my laptop as a comparison point for the, some of the things I've been talking about. Um, and let's, let's generate some data. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna generate some data here. So this is just um, data. Oh yeah, it's a wonderful name, I know. Um, this is just a three column double uh, data set, nothing really too dramatic. Of course, DuckDB works with arbitrary, you know, data frames, it's just for the demo. Um, and this uh, data frame has 10 million rows, like not crazy. Um, but of course, that's carefully chosen so some of my comparisons will actually finish in the time I have left in this talk. Okay, so now I'm gonna just import that into Postgres, and I might maybe take some questions in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. So the client-server protocol really kills you there because all the data, well, all the 10 million rows have to now go through a socket, even though it's on the same machine. And yeah, okay, here we go, 10 seconds. Uh, so that, that, is, that is something that, that will, take, will just take a long time to go to the, to the external database server. And if I do the same thing in DuckDB, I would not be able to take questions because as it is in process, it will just, it will just directly go to the, to the, the engine running in R. One thing I should mention here, this is not an in-memory kind of game. So DuckDB is running in an on-disk mode, which means that we have actually written this data to the disk Flushed, uh, called f-sync the whole, you know, the whole thing, like the transactionality, everything happened, the same sort of thing that you would expect from a database server. Okay, now we can try the same thing in reverse. We'll just call db retable on the thing we've just written. Ah, oh, yeah, five seconds, okay. So that's, that's now the inverse. We've tried to, we have to go through the same sort of socket problem again. Now let's do the same in DuckDB again. And now this is where this really shines because we have created this entire data set from the table data that was stored on disk back into an R data frame in like 0 0.1 seconds. Well, that's, I'm happy about that. And why this is kind of funny is I have this like really basic model fitting and please don't laugh at my uh, you know, linear model code here because I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I think like transferring the data out of Postgres takes five seconds, fitting, thank you, a linear model to it takes 1.6 seconds. You would say that one is a bit more difficult than the other, right? One is just like copy, the other is like, okay, we have to do the damn thing with the residuals and so on. So this is just, uh, I think 0 0.1 seconds though is the right sort of relationship to that, to that number. Okay, 
Um, but I mentioned that we can directly look at data frames that are in the R memory space. So here, let me show you something that is not in DBI. Um, maybe I should, you know, arm wrestle Kirill to edit. Um, in, we can just basically say in DuckDB, we can say DuckDB register and, what that, and give it a connection and a table name. In this, came, in this case, it's the wonderful MT cars. Um, and then give it a data frame and say, look, I want you to treat this data frame as a table. But no actual copying is going on, right? We're not, we're not, we're not doing the import. We're not doing anything. We just say, look, DuckDB, here's a pointer to a data frame. Please try to treat it as a table. And then, once we have done that, we can just run a query. So I can say, hey, select star from MT cars, blah, 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 and it will just, you know, lo and behold, run this query for you. Or I can also, like, do some bit more complicated things. So here I'm running a, a distinct, I'm sorry, <coughs> on, um, on, a, on a particular column and in T cars, and I'm, I'm doing a filter here with the where column, and I'm asking DuckDB to show me what the query plan is going to be. Remember, I told you about the whole, you know, automatic end-to-end opti -end optimization. So we have these, like, operators that we string together, the highly efficient operators, like a group by a filter. And down here, we have the data frame scan, which is the thing that basically just looks at the data frame and runs, the, uh, and, and it treats as a table. And this can also then, this can also, this also works with a bit more complicated use uh, example. So here I'm taking some taxi data. This uh, table is a bit bigger, it's 2.5 gigabytes of parquet. It has uh, eight, uh, it has a lot of rows. Let me actually, actually, you know, why, why, don't, why don't you just uh, find out how many rows there are here? Uh, now you get to do it after all, fr from, see? Okay, so this is 84 million rows. It's a bit more sizable. And now I can basically take a fairly heavy query here that computes the, um, the day and hour and the tip amount as a median grouped by day and hour on the status. It's a fairly complex query. It will be one of these queries that will actually make your, um, you know, your computer warmer. And even that quite heavy, um, uh, hang on, I want to do the um, query completes in a very, very short time. Okay, so now I'm going back to my slides. That concludes the demo. It went well, I think. Um, to, to conclude, uh, so DuckDB, I was talking DuckDB. DuckDB is an in-process analytical data management system. I try to explain what that means. Uh, it's, it's very simple, it's feature-rich, fast-free, and you just choose all four. Um, and it is really deeply integrated with R. In fact, uh, I'm quite happy on how you know, our core has been responsive to our requests of changing things in R itself so we can make database integration into R quicker. It's kind of an, I don't think that happens with Oracle, let's just say. Um, and now I'm really happy to take some questions. Thank you. So I have a quick question before the next speaker. Um, you showed an example of DuckDB processing a data frame very, very quickly. Um, can uh, other structures, such as nested list data, be used in the same way? Um, that's a great question. So we actually be working on doing nested structures in data frames. Um, we also support scanning arrow objects in R. Um, but like raw lists, uh, I think you have to add a class data frame to them before you can scan it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker once again.